The scripture for this service is Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Amen. After Shalom Choir and Nisi Orchestra, we'll glorify our Father God with the praise. Senior Pastor will deliver a message under the title of Arise, Shine. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ and members around the world who are attending this service through the Internet and through GCN. Today's scripture, Isaiah 60, verse 1, is a well-known verse for you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen, risen upon you. This is the verse that God gave to our church right from the beginning. The duty of this church is to arise in this ever-darkening world, to reveal the glory of God, and to shine the light. Our duty is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to numerous dying souls with the message of holiness and God's power. Through this message, I hope that you will become a glorious instrument that will be used for God's providence. I pray in the name of the Lord that you may arise from the darkness to shine the light and lead countless souls to salvation. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, for you to arise and shine, first of all, you have to arm yourself with the Word. Many of you read at least a chapter and memorize a verse of the Bible every day. Also, you listen to previous sermons or read the books diligently. But just reading, memorizing, and listening to many messages does not necessarily mean arming yourself with the Word. Even though you understood the word and were touched by it, we cannot say you have armed yourself with the word. Only when the word you heard fills you, fills you completely and it is completely yours can it be said that you are armed with the word. Knowing the word a knowledge means nothing. If you worship in spirit and truth, you remember the message that you heard after the worship. Well, do you remember it or not? If you worship in spirit and truth, if you hear the message as sweet as honey, you remember it after the worship. After you watch an interesting movie, you can remember the whole story. You can do it every day. It's the same with the Word of God. It is the Word of life. You should cultivate the message into you for each week by praying. You do it to make the message become yours. You do it to cast off your flesh and to become true children of God the Father. Only when the Word the word you heard fills you completely and it is completely yours can it be said that you are armed with the word. When you have heard the word and had the realization about it, then your life has to change according to your realization. Your, your heart, thoughts, and deeds have to change. For example, suppose you heard about the Syrophoenician woman and were impressed. You thought she made a humble confession of faith no matter what Jesus said because she had the faith to receive the answer. Could I do the same if I were in a, her situation? How beautiful her heart is. I want to have this kind of heart. You listened to the sermon about Sarah Finnegan and Lady. And you were impressed. Now, did it become yours? Did the message become yours? Perhaps there are few. Suppose, suppose I insult you. You came to me to receive my prayer, and I say to you in front of many people, Elder, why do you not pray for yourself to receive such a trifle answer? Are you really an elder? Then how are you 
our elder is going to re react? What about our pastors? What about our senior deaconesses? The Syrophoenician lady was insulted by our Lord in front of many people. But she humbly accepted our Lord's advice and words. Although you are insulted or wrongly rebuked by me, you gotta say yes and amen. This is trust. Because the Syrophoenician woman believed and trusted the Lord, she went to the Lord for her daughter's healing. If she had got no faith, she would not have received God's answer. I shouldn't get offended or feel my pride is hurt by contempt, but make confession of goodness until the end. You may make up your mind like, I'll do good until the end, I'll make a good confession. But you cannot do that. You should be able to make such a confession from your heart. But most people do know the scripture, but cannot practice it. You don't know the scripture if someone slaps you on the right cheek or for the other cheek also. Now, if someone actually slaps you on your right cheek, you should offer the other cheek also, with a smile. Even when someone is picking on you and trampling on you, you shouldn't break peace with them. You should treat them with goodness. You should forgive them. You should understand them. And you should serve them. This is the Lord's heart. And you must have this kind of heart. If you make your vessel like this, you can become one with the Lord and with God. And you will receive answers. Think about yourself. You've heard so many messages, but you haven't cultivated such a vessel of heart. You have not cultivated Joseph-like heart. Joseph worked faithfully for his master over his house as an overseer to the extent that he was totally recognized. However, Joseph was falsely accused. How frustrating. He was put in prison, the special prison for political prisoners. There was no hope of getting out of it. There was no hope, but he didn't even make an excuse. Why? Joseph believed that God the Almighty was with him and that the God would rescue him. When the time came, he totally relied on God. He didn't even try to do evil at all. Though his master's wife made him like that, he didn't even try to revenge on her. What a beautiful heart he has in God's sight. That's why God used him. Think about God's people in the Bible. Goodness is the most important thing. God looks at the goodness of heart, the vessel that they will come out through their trials. They may look like evil because of their untruths and evil, staying in the world, but God looks at their heart. That's why God calls them, and then He refines them. God lets them remove the evil things input in the world. The what will be left? What's inside? Your diamonds, pearls. No matter how rough rocks are, if they are refined repeatedly and cut and trimmed, we can get gold and diamonds and all kinds of jewels. Likewise, God knows the good inner heart of a person. There are many meaning in the expression, the inner heart is good. There is goodness with no evil, and there are the heart of no change, the heart of no cunningness, the heart of no betrayal, and the like. This is goodness. Turning the other cheek also is one of many goodness. The heart of no betrayal in any situation the heart of no cunningness and the heart of no change are also goodness. 
God chooses this kind of people and refine them to cast off their evil that was input in the world and give them power and then use them. So look at God's people in the Bible. There was no one who betrayed. Even though they were martyred or stoned to death, they never betrayed. They had no cunningness. Of course, Peter once betrayed when he was in terror for his life, but it was before he received the Holy Spirit, and thereafter worthy he was faithful until death. God's people never betray. They never change their hearts. That's why their inner hearts are upright in God's sight. Even though they were falsely accused or betrayed, they don't make an excuse. They try to save others, try to forgive them, serve them, save them. They did only in goodness, not with evil. So I told you, you got to treat them, treat them with goodness. Goodness will overcome evil. That's how we have experienced. So God told His church to do so, and we've done that. So you heard the words of God a hundred times and received grace? You got to cultivate it in your heart, and arm yourself with the word, and you got to live by it. Unless you don't do it, you just let this word you know, slip through. You cannot manifest the power of God because God is not with you. But it's easy to come into spirit and cultivate it. You also pray earnestly for what you have realized. You pray, let me accept my, any kind of advice or rebuke with humbleness, and let me seek by faith until the end. But the next day, you have a meeting in church, and somebody tells you something that hurts your feelings. He says, why do you boast too much? You're just like the things that reveal yourself and brag about your compliment all the time. It doesn't look good. Now, how good would it be if you just remember the message about the Syrophoenician lady? If the truth is cultivated in you, you will remember it and you can act in goodness. However, it's too bad that you understood it only as knowledge and all kinds of fleshly thoughts surface. You think, I tried to do my best because they were not trying hard enough. And now they judge me saying I'm boastful? You're getting upset. You're feeling uneasy. You're feeling afflicted. I just tried to plant faith in that person with my testimony and they say I brag about my accomplishments. You have uncomfortable feelings with many kinds of thoughts. But the Holy Spirit works at one corner of your mind. So you also think the Syrophoenician lady accepted the words that were a lot more insulting. But you have stronger fleshly thoughts than this voice of the Holy Spirit. You develop hard feelings and say to yourself, the Syrophoenician woman humbled herself because it was before Jesus. He is no better than me and how can you say those things to me? He is not a pastor or my superior, so how can he be so rude to me, especially in the presence of many other people. The Syrophoenician lady well, has never heard about the Lord before. She just heard the rumor. The word of God is not cultivated in you as spirit, but it remains only as knowledge, so it cannot change your life. You heard many messages, right? So you heard them. But it didn't help you change, so they are all useless to you. If you have really armed yourself with the word, you will not have any discomfort. 
When you receive advice of any kind, you can just think about how it applies to you, and if you realize something, you can change yourself. It wouldn't matter even if the other person misunderstood your intention and your heart. If you can just accept it with a smile, I'm sorry if it looked that way. I didn't mean something like that, but I will try to change myself more. Then, how peaceful your mind would be. If your heart is filled with the truth as a, like this, to that same extent, you will have authority over your words. The Moses, Aaron, I mean Moses' words got authority. But even though his brother was, uh, Aaron was a good speaker, there was no authority. Apostle Paul was not good at speech, but he had authority in whatever he said. When you preach the gospel or counsel somebody, you can drive away darkness and you can accomplish the kingdom of God more greatly. When you can clearly hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, you know exactly what kind of message to preach or when you give counsel to others, you do it according to each individual. Brothers and sisters, in the past, I've emphasized the importance of spiritual art and armament with the word extensively. But today, I especially ask you to develop the ability to teach others as well as spiritually arming yourself with the word. Though you've armed yourself spiritually, if you don't teach well, it is only good for you. So you have to develop the ability to teach others. You shouldn't only take, keep the message you hear, but you should also be able to deliver it to others. That's why I'm looking for good preachers. Just reading the word of God is not, is not enough. It cannot give grace. When you deliver words of God, you have to explain them, and you have to taught how to live by them, how to cast off sin, how to live. You gotta give instructions on all these things. If you just read the Bible and explain it, well, they can also read the Bible, and they can also read the, uh, some explanations, and they can manage their Christian life like that. Even if you are impressed by a certain message, in many cases, you cannot deliver the contents of that message properly to other people. If you want to learn the word even to be able to teach others, you got to try harder. You should also be able to freely deliver messages about prayers and holiness, which are necessary for practical Christian lives. Our elders, you should do the same. Of course, as I already mentioned, it goes without saying that you diligently have to arm yourself with those messages spiritually. Our pastors, you work hard to deliver to arm yourself with the word of God, right? But you are so busy, how can I arm myself with the word for about an hour every day and deliver a message? Well, if you say so, You've heard it wrong. I told you. Didn't I tell you? Memorize them? No. I didn't say you gotta memorize what you have heard. It's okay to forget them. I'm not saying that you gotta remember them all, remember them all and then deliver the message based on it. I told you to do it from the heart. If you cultivated the word in your heart, then that's it. You can deliver a message. You cannot memorize the entire you know, sermon. And even if you, even if you made a practice, you would, not, you would not work, right? So you worry about it. Why should I cannot remember them all? So if you use your brain, you cannot deliver a message. It's the same with the prayer. Those who pray with the knowledge, they still have to write down their prayer after five, after ten years. They have to read, the, read what they wrote because they do it with knowledge when, when they pray. you got to do it with prayer. you got to pray with the heart, in spirit, then you can pray about an hour, two hours, three hours, you can do so.
You will not lose your focus. The Holy Spirit will help you not to lose that. But there are people who go to wrong direction while praying for the service. They have to pray for the service. But they go to somewhere else. So you have to arm yourself with the word of God diligently. I hope you will learn the word both spiritually and as your knowledge as well. When you are armed spiritually, you can obey the word. When something is up, you are reminded of the right word in your heart. This is the voice of the Holy Spirit. In doing so, I pray in the name of the Lord that you will be used preciously in the church that will arise and shine. Brothers and sisters, for you to arise and shine, second, you must have spiritual love. Those who realize the love of God will naturally come to love God. You also have received grace of God, so you say you love God and the Lord. That's why you lead this kind of faithful Christian life. But if you truly love God, your love will definitely be revealed as deeds of loving your brothers as yourselves. There are such verses in the Bible, like if you don't have the deeds of loving your Christian brothers as yourself, God will not answer you. Are there not? If you don't know well, recite the Lord's Prayer. It's there. It's the Lord's Prayer that you recite every day. See, through you recited the Lord's Prayer every day, you did it with your lips, not from your heart. If you do it from your heart, you keep that in mind. Ah, the Lord told me to do so and so in the Lord's Prayer. But now, how was my life? If you had arguments with others, if you didn't understand others, if you didn't serve others, then you didn't live your life according to the Lord's Prayer. 1 John 4.21 says, And this commandment we have for from him, that the one who loves God should love this brother also. The one who loves God should love his brother also. You long for New Jerusalem and you always pray longing and seeking holiness. But even though you have faith, and you long for New Jerusalem, some of you cannot love your brother. You say something like, I can accept everybody else, but not this person. I don't like him. Or you say, I don't hate him, but we don't really agree on anything, so I just ignore him. You say you don't hate them, but this is actually very far from love. Some of you have some conflicts even though you have worked together for many years as leaders. Of course, you got all have some reasons. But there is no reason to get stuck between husband and wife. They got reasons why they argue. I asked, why do you argue? Then the husband put blame on the wife, and the wife puts blame on the husband. If you go on like this for five or ten years, what, when can you change? The message from this altar is asking you to put blame on yourself then you can have the faith, not as knowledge. When you put blame on yourself, then you can discover yourself in your heart. You can realize how bad you were to your wife. But you say you are good, but your wife is wrong. You don't discover yourself. Both of you do so. So many years later, one got sick, one suffered. If the wife got sick, then the husband would suffer. Even though there are a few in family, they cannot make peace, especially in this church, the church of God. But they say they go out and visit. I'm so sad about that. I'm so sad for my you know, sheep. But they got reasons, though. They have reasons to argue with. 
There is a sense for stealer. And the thief, they got reasons. They got reasons when they are imprisoned. They say they are innocent. But most of them are not innocent. You say, he made a big mistake to me, but he doesn't even apologize. Or, he always opposes what I do and gives me a hard time. I want to talk to such people. I've never felt uneasy with anyone during my ministry. I've never broken peace with another. I've never hated anyone. I've never turned the high... I've never had any, any, anyone whom I don't like. Then what's wrong with me? Am I wrong? There are all kinds of people in this congregation. Pastors, Levite workers, elders, people who have faith, but who don't, work, who don't have faith. People who are well-educated and who are not. People who are rich and who are poor. But I have nobody whom I feel uneasy. I like them all. I love them all. Children and students as well. You know, you have other reasons, such as his style of working is so different from me. He is too stubborn. I am the leader in the organization, but he doesn't submit to the hierarchy and just insist on his own. But no matter how many reasons you have, the most fundamental problem is that you do not love him. Love is gentle and it seeks the benefit of others. You think in goodness in others' viewpoint. You believe he will do better and hope. And believe and endure and bear with him. If you got unpleasant feeling, then you need to relieve it quickly. If you had treated your husband or wife or children with the feeling, you think about how too difficult it was for them. You love them. Well, say you left home feeling unpleasant when you go to work. Though you usually call your wife in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening because you want to know everything about her, like, you know, whether she ate meals, whether she went to the market, or something like those. But you don't want to call her because you were hurt in the, feel, in the morning. You remember the feeling that you had in the morning. So you were hurt. So you don't want to call. Man, I don't want to call her. We'll see what would happen to her, even though I don't call her. You used to call her many times a day. Now what should you do? What do you do? You erase the uh, uh, phone records. I mean, you have to think, I made an argument with my wife. It must have bothered her so much. She would feel it so difficult. You want to think like this. Just as the hymnal said, you stretch out your hand first. You gotta call her first. You should become like this. You shouldn't spend the entire day with uneasy feeling from the morning. What if that goes the next day? Your husbands and wives, don't be like this. If there is some misunderstanding, you can talk with each other and straighten it up. Husband, when you get to the office, call her and say frankly, Honey, that's not what I meant. I'm so sorry. You can straighten out by talking on the phone like this. 
that when you get home, how happy you'll be with your wife. Family with no fight. Your children can grow up happily. You think in goodness, in others' viewpoint. You believe he will do better and hope and believe and endure and bear with him. You can smile at him even though he lacks many things because you believe he will change. If you don't believe they will change, it's not easy to keep going, especially in God's work. Though they haven't changed today, believe, hope, and endure that they will change in a week or in a month or in a later, until the end. Suppose nine out of ten changed and one did not, then it is the person's fault. No matter how hard I try, if the person doesn't want to change, I cannot help it. Right? He doesn't even want to go to the second kingdom of heaven. He just wants to go to the paradise. Some people will change and go to the second kingdom or third kingdom or New Jerusalem. And that's what I believe, well, that's what I hope, that's what I endure for and with love. Even though he does evil and does harm to you, you understand him and forgive him. You can, um, you can understand him by thinking about his background and environment and considering his measure of faith and, mis and understanding his position. Also, when you see those whom you love, even though they have some faults, you don't try to reveal them. You just try to see their good points. If you see others' faults, you cannot understand them. See with no faults, but see only good things. Think, hear, and speak only in a good way. And control yourself and speak in goodness. Then you will have no misunderstanding, you will have no hard feelings, and you will be peace with everyone. And only that kind of person can go into New Jerusalem. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification, without which no one will see the Lord. Even though the other's actions do not agree with your education and common sense, you help him do better by using his good points. You will pray for his shortcomings with all your heart so that he can become more perfect. The brothers around you have been trying to change themselves, listening to the holiness gospel till now. They are precious co-workers of faith, for they have been together in overcoming the trials in the church with fasting and prayers. Just as God first loved you when you were not perfect, God also loved them and brought them with the price of the blood of the Lord. And now God is saying to you, my children, love each other. Come together as one. As you should keep this will of God in your mind to broaden your heart and cultivate love in you. If you have discomforts with others for, the, for these reasons now, how would you be able to accept and embrace countless souls in the future? I hope you will love and you will love any kind of soul and accept him with the love of the Lord who loved even his enemies, brothers and sisters. In order for you to rise and shine, third, you have to pray powerfully. Just as man cannot stop breathing, God's children must not stop breathing. Without prayer, you cannot cast up sins to become sanctified and you cannot perform your church duties. Our members know how important prayer is. You learn about prayer first, and you got to maintain your Christian life, but you don't know how important it is. Our missions, after Tuesday prison worship service, they got to come to Daniel prayer meeting quickly, but they gather together to have a meeting, and well over 10.30, then they come to Daniel prayer meeting. It means they don't know the meaning of the importance of Daniel prayer meeting. Pray without ceasing. It has, it is, it makes, you know, it's a great commitment to Father God. In 1980s, Father God showed this vision to me, skipping a Sunday. Someone was staring, you know, coming up the stairway to heaven. Every week is identical to one step. So eventually they go to heaven. Now, he skipped one week, then there was no step for him. And underneath the step, where there is no step, you can see hell. Father God showed that vision. 
What I'm saying is that you go to heaven step by step, but if you skip Sunday, a week, then the, the, the stair disa disappears, which is equivalent to one week. And the Satan does not lose that chance. So one, when the one week becomes two weeks and two weeks becomes three weeks, then people get getting a, a far from God. And because of that missing step, you know, they become slow to come to heaven, or otherwise they let us stop. The same goes with the prayer. You should pray continuously. Ceasing praying for one day is a great loss. Those who pray all the time know this. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit all the time. You have to pray in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit today and tomorrow. And each time you pray, remember my testimony? No matter how tired I was, I became inspired by the Holy Spirit in 10 minutes. No matter how hard I was, how tired I was after working all day long, I could get into a deep prayer in 10 minutes. That's because I never ceased to pray. But if you cease praying, it's not easy to get into a deeper prayer. You are backsliding in the faith. You should continue to go up. Like the turtle, you should keep going. You shouldn't take a nap during the race, like the red. Those who want to go to New Jerusalem, they should never stop going. Ceasing praying just once is a great loss. That's why the prophet Samuel said, I will never commit sin to cease to pray. I've lived my whole life with prayer. I could keenly feel the seizing praying is a great loss spiritually. First Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words but in power. Those who do not pray, even though they seem to try hard and accomplish something, they cannot bear good fruits in the end. One thing you have to remember here is that you not only have to continue to pray diligently, but also you have to pray powerfully. Some people pray not only in Daniel prayer meeting, but also during their personal times. But they don't have improvement in their faith for so many years. Their self-righteousness and frameworks do not break. If there is no development in your faith, you cannot break your self-righteousness and frameworks. And you just stay where you are. Then you cannot go into spirit after 10, 20, or 30 years of believing life. This means they are not offering up powerful enough prayers so that God can work. Among those who do not miss prayer, uh, pray, prayer meetings and sit on, sit on one of the front seats, there are some cases where their aroma of prayer is not going up to God. Some people do not even know what they are praying praying for because they have other thoughts and doze off. Those who habitually doze off during the prayers are distracted and have poor postures for prayer. And they say they didn't sleep when someone asked them. But they surely slept. But they said they didn't. They think they don't sleep. It has been an habit. Even though even they are dozing off, they do this. Some people use their lips even though they are sleeping. So please don't do that, okay? Otherwise, you cannot receive answer. Someone prays about an hour and a half. Their hands on over their face. They touch their hair, they touch their ears or nose for about an hour and a half. There are people like that. Where are their hearts and minds? Why they touch their nose, heads, or hair? Why do they do so? They cannot pray from the depths of their heart. Then they cannot change. They cannot come into spirit. 
If you kneel down and pray earnestly with your hands together, your lower abdomen and your hands will be strained and you will have a clear mind. So that's why you have to maintain your right posture. Then you can have a good habit. But those who just sit back and pray can easily doze off. And even though they don't doze off, they cannot really pray fervently. 1 Corinthians 14.14 14 says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. As written, praying in other tongues and prayer of the heart must have blame, must have in the balance. Uh, I don't know what's the ideal for the balance, but for me, two-thirds is a prayer of heart and a third is a prayer in a tongue, or I pray in a tongue less. For you, you can do it freely. You shouldn't pray in a tongue too much because you cannot bear the fruit of heart. Pray in a tongue is your spirit's prayer. You should pray a prayer of heart so that you can sanctify your heart. You shouldn't only pray in a tongue without understanding it, but you should do it also because it helps your spiritual prosper. Especially when you pray for the kingdom of God, you have to work clearly, pray with your own language. But some people pray in tongues, both when in both when they pray for personal matters and for the kingdom of God. In this case, many of them do not pray with the heart speaking, speaking in tongues. They have idle thoughts while they speak in tongues with their lips. Your spirit is praying, so you mind, your mind can be elsewhere. Look at me. I'm praying with my lips like this, but my mind is there. You shouldn't be doing like this. When you pray in a tongue, you should pray with your heart. Also, some people pray with through their words, but they pray with meaningless repetitions. Or some people repeat the same words as if they were chanting. When people have conversations, they have the subject that they talk about, and they talk in a way that the listener can understand. Even though you are in, in, introvert, if you make a friend, you can talk for five minutes at first, then ten minutes, and then twenty minutes, and an hour, and then all day long. It's the same with prayer. Practice makes a long prayer. When you talk for an hour, you remember what you talked about, and you can explain it again. It's the same with prayers. Those who pray with all their heart will clearly express the things that are appropriate for God to hear. You should express clearly. Why? God looks at your heart. But your angel cannot, miss, cannot understand your prayer when you babble on. Although your angel is so excellent, how can he understand your prayer? Look at me. Now, how can you understand this prayer? How can he carry your prayer only when he, I mean, he can carry your prayer only when he understands it. Though your voice is low, if it is clear, your prayer goes up to heaven. If they really asked for what they wish, they can repeat the same contents again even if they prayed for one whole hour. You shouldn't just list the contents that you memorized, but you have to pray earnestly with your heart by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If you pray earnestly with all your heart, you will soon be filled by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You can sleep only a few hours and then you have to go to work, so you will be tired. But if you pray in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you don't feel tired even though you sleep a little, so you can work well. The next day, when you begin to pray, you will be inspired by the Holy Spirit soon. That's why you should not cease to pray. It's like you can continue to pray from yesterday. But if you cease praying for a day or two, your faithfulness stops. That's why you shouldn't cease praying even though you pray a little.
I urge you to check your prayers once again. You have to pray with all your heart, as fervently as Jacob prayed at the Jabbok River, with the determination that you will change tonight. You have to pray for the kingdom of God with your love for God the Father and the church and with your passion to give glory to God the Father. Only when this kind of powerful prayer is accumulated can, I, can this church accomplish world evangelization and you can be used for precious purpose. Let me conclude this message. Brothers and sisters, today I talked about three things that you should have as workers of this church that will give you glory to God at the end time. I talked about spiritual armament of the world, spiritual love, and powerful prayers. When countless souls come to us, you must be able to teach them with the truth, accept them with love, and pray for them powerfully. If you can support the ministry this way, I can accomplish world evangelization and fulfill my ministry with more confidence through God's power. Through this message, I hope you can finish your preparation to be used as main players of the era of Canaan. May you arise and shine everywhere when God reveals His glory all over the earth under the name of my men, in the name of our Lord Jesus. Let's receive senior pastor's prayer for the sick on screen. Lay your hand on the sick part of your body. If you are not sick, lay your hand on your chest and receive this prayer for the desires of your heart. Hallelujah, Almighty Father God of love. Please lay your hands on all those who are receiving this prayer. Now. By transcending space and time, show your works to your children who are receiving this prayer on the internet and through GCN in grand churches and local sanctuaries around the world. Give them the faith to believe, drive away their negative thoughts and doubts, and drive away all tests and trials. From head to toe, all entrails, joints, nerves, tissues, and cells, whatever the sick part may be, Burn them with the fire of the Holy Spirit and with the original light. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses, infirmities, go away, may the light come. Scorch all the terminal and incurable diseases with the fire of the Holy Spirit and drive away all endemic diseases such as malaria. All contagious diseases such as cold, flu and fever, go away. Protect them from all kinds of germs and viruses. Heal them of stomach, lung, liver, breast, uterine, intestinal, and all other cancers. AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high and low blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, heart, lung, women's diseases, and all other inflammations. Be cleansed and go away. Heal them of polio, stroke, arthritis, and herniated discs. Back pain, headache, neuralgia, and all other pains go away. Epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and other mental diseases go away. All kinds of paralysis, illusion, you get up, walk, and leap. Let the eyes see well, let the ears hear well. Let the blind come to see, the deaf come to hear, and the mute come to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents and fix their broken bones. Let the heat and burning sensation go away. Restore them from burns and let there be no burning scar left. All kinds of drug addictions, poisoning, and substance abuse go away. Let the dead nerves, tissues, and cells be regenerated and bring the dead back to life. Give them the blessing of conception. May you receive the blessing of conception. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, and the ruler of the air, go away. And their servants also go away. Go away, you evil, unclean, false, and deceitful spirits, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen the bonds of wickedness. Darkness, you go away. May the light come. Father God, give them strength to cry it out in prayer, to cast off sin, and to be sanctified. As their spirit and soul prosper, let all things go well with them, and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters throughout this week. Bless them to lead a prosperous life without any problems. With the firewall of the Holy Spirit, with the heavenly host and angels, and with your blessing eyes, protect all your children, their family, workplace, and business.
give our students wisdom and understanding and give them fervor and passion to study hard. Keep their hearts and minds from the worldly things and bless our students to love our Father God all the more fervently. Whether your children eat or drink or whatever they may do, let them do it all for the glory of Father God. I met God, I experienced God, I received answers and blessings. Bless them to say like this with their lips. Father God, thank you. Be glorified alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.